All right, so we're moving on from informed consent to cloning, something that's really exciting, right? Or really scary, depending on how you think about it. So a um, little cloning history, and I'll show you <coughs> um, another slide in just a second. Um, but really, since 1885, we've been trying to figure out how to manipulate embryonic cells. So 1885, uh, sea urchin cells uh, were shaken down. <coughs> sea urchins, you can take parts of them off. They'll grow into full organisms, so they're full of stem cells, right? Remember, stem cells have two types. There are... Uh, so I'm going to get my pen to work. They're a totipotent and pluripotent. So totipotents can develop into anything, and pluripotents can develop into a cell line, right? A certain type of cell. So, but sea urchins are full of the totipotent type, right? So these are perfect. So 1885, they did that. They showed that they could create urchins from separating urchin cells. Right. So in 1902, right, so they tied a hair around a fertilized mass of cells and separated a cell and showed that it grew into a twin. And that's a lot of what happens when we have um, maternal twins, right? The egg separates, or one of the cells separates as it's dividing, and it just becomes another one that looks like the other one because the DNA is identical, right? In 1928, right? So they created an anucleate cell, right? So they pinched a cell with the hair and they caused the nucleus to stay to one side, but they separated the cell, right? So, and then they untied the hair and let the nucleus go to the cell that didn't have it and they cut it off and it started to grow. So that's the first, uh, evidence of nuclear transplantation. This becomes important because this nuclear transplantation um, is going to be how we create Dolly the sheep, right? Um, 1952, right? So we get our first tadpole with nuclear transplantation, right? 1958. So this is an important one because then I'm using an intestinal cell, right? So I'm using a somatic or a body cell take a nucleus out and I put it into an enucleate egg or an anucleate egg, an egg without a nucleus, right? And we can show that we can create a tadpole that way. Now, frogs are um, great species to use. Their, their genome's not super large, right? Their cells are pretty big. Um, so, but we're showing that we can do something, right? So in 1975, we, we go to mammals, or we go to a more advanced species, right? Uh, we had nuclear transport, but it only grew in culture. 1984, so we're gonna start speeding up here. Um, then we, uh, it's the first time we use electroporation, right? So we're able to use electroporation to pulse electricity out of cell to make it open up a little bit so we can get things to come in. That's how we get our shuttle plasmids in. All right, so electroporation, we developed that in 1984. If you think about it, that's not too long ago. That's two years after I graduated from high school. I know that's shocking, All right? We have a pause for 12 years, 1996. First live sheep from electroporation used to culture chills, All right? So that opens the door for farming and transgenic animals. 1996, we get Dolly, right? The shocking thing about Dolly is they don't tell you it took 277 attempts to get a live birth sheep. So they took a, a mother's somatic cell, right, and they put it into an anucleate egg, um, and then they brought it to term. Right, and Dolly lived for a while. She just died of old age at a young age, right, because she had old DNA. Right, 1997, right, because Dolly was a success, uh, they cloned a rhesus monkey. And they said, well, if we can do this, we can probably do humans. And about this time, 1998, we get a lot of legislature on stem cell research, um, just kind of putting the brakes on this, right? We figure out we can do this stuff, um, but we may want to take a look at if we should. So 1997 is an important one, right? We create a transgenic cow that can produce uh, factor nine for treating hemophilia, right? 
So this is successful par farming. Again, the government takes a pause and says, well, um, if we produce medications and foods, does that violate autonomy of persons taking the foods, right? It's not like a fortification, like we put B vitamins from vegetables inside our bread um, because people don't eat vegetables like they should, but it's not the same sort of thing. Right, 1999, right, we're back at it. Cloning animals becomes more easily leading to transgenic laboratory animals. So remember, this is important, right? So uh, in our preclinical phase, we'll often use transgenic animals. We'll get an animal that we hybridize with a human cell uh, to produce a genetic trait, right? And that genetic trait, we try medicines on. So transgenic animals were important. Uh, we're able to do that in 1999. Again, not that long ago, 20 years ago, right? 2001, we bring back an extinct goat. It only lived for a couple months, I think. Um, but hey, Jurassic Park, right? That's the author of Jurassic Park, who wrote the book that you're starting to read this week. Um, that showed it was possible. All right, 2007, I get a rhesus monkey, primate stem cell fused by somatic, right, with an anucleate cell, right? So we're able to do that with a rhesus monkey, so it opens the door for human cloning. And then the controversial one, right, human stem cells created in South Korea, right? And remember, that's following Hong's 2004-2005 debacle. Um, and the scientists are very skeptical, right? So uh, I'll show you this in a little bit, and then we'll talk about that. Welcome, look at it, give you a little better um, view into all these advances. Okay, so here we go, arguments against cloning. All right, should we human clone? So the arguments, um, cloning is unnatural. All right, sorry, my cat's tail keeps coming in the way. Um, it violates the right of clone to a unique identity. So if someone knows you're a clone, does it, does it violate autonomy? Right. Um, the result in demeaning artificial manufacture of children as products. Right. If you can order a child as a product, would you treat it less than if it was your own? Right. Uh, it authorizes human manipulations and study of infants for purely scientific reasons. Remember, um, the Nuremberg and Helsinki reports say that we can't use people as study subjects, right? We have to have an intention. But if they're clones, are they still people, right? So that would be the argument. Um, there was a argument years ago about growing clones is we could just grow them for organs, right? Or if you had a child with a genetic disease, right? You could clone your child with a genetic disease, right? And maybe fix the genes, Right, then you would have a healthy version. All right. Arguments for cloning are just that. It appeals to reproductive liberty. Remember we talked about, we probably haven't talked about it. Yeah, maybe. I can't remember if we did. Um, but uh, we shouldn't do IVF, in vitro fertilization, right, for companies or not for companies, for people who can't have children, right, because it's unnatural. So remember, people said we shouldn't do it because it's unnatural, right? It's a violation of what God intended, right? But people have reproductive liberty. If they want to have a child, then the technology is out there they should be able to have. So cloning is just that, right? It appeals to reproductive technology. But it's different, right? So if I'm doing IVF, I'm still taking... Right? I'm still taking a sperm and I'm artificially inserting it into an egg. Right? So it's still genetic variation. Cloning is not. They argue it would benefit in fertile couples. So what would you do? Would you take the somatic cell from the man? Would you take it from the woman? Right? Uh, would it be treated differently? So if you made a genetic clone of your wife and you just later didn't like your wife, would you treat your child differently because they're essentially the genetic uh, duplicate of your wife? Same thing happens if you take a male, right? Um, this one I think was just creepy, right? It offers couples. Oh, I lost my pen. 
it offers couples the ability to reclaim uh, lost clones of our children. Um, and that's just not right. right. So this is an important statement. Cloning would help us overcome the unpredictable variety that still rules human reproduction and allow us to benefit from perpetuating superior genetic endowments. So this guy's arguing for Gattaca, right? So the wealthy would be able to pay for better children and they would be genetically superior. And they would probably be viewed as genetically superior, right? So if you're applying for a job, right, you'd be able to state that. All right. So we're going to look up this guy, right? So that's your um, assignment today. We're going to look up that guy, Januki, and we're going to uh, post our comments on a study. How did he do it? What's the criticism? And what's your belief on a moral ethical level? All right, so that was it for today, and I will talk to you soon.